This episode is scripted by Newell Fisher, with script assistance by John Ruths, and is narrated, recorded and edited by Newell Fisher. Hello, and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 71, in which we will be going through section 12 of the 1978 film, Captain Holly. One piece of borough keeping this episode, I mentioned comments from David Morley on the Twitter feed last time. Well, he has also commented at greater length on the Facebook group. These were too late for the last episode, but they are worth quoting here as his remarks are a wonderful example of the devotion this book can inspire. He wrote, quote, The book had a significant impact on my personal and literary development, and I wrote a short study of it for the Royal Society of Literature when I was elected as a fellow in 2019. As a teenager, I walked the entirety of the rabbit's journey, Sandalford to the test, twice in different seasons during the late 1970s, while camping on the down near the beach hangar. What might be of interest is that I kept a photographic record of these site visits, and my sister went to the Isle of Man to interview Richard Adams at some length. She took along these written and visual records to show the author, who kindly signed the photo albums in which they were stored. I also became very interested by Angela Morley's, no relation, score to the 1978 film, Buying the LP. I was most interested in Angela Morney's personal history with regard to the making of this score, and which was explored in Sarah Woolley's Radio 4 play, 1977. Although it is no longer available, this listing is here. End quote. He gives the link and adds, quote, I have been entranced by the seriousness of the endeavour of this podcast since I discovered it. To repeat something others have commented on, the sense of community, of belonging this podcast engenders is highly appreciated. I love the depth in which the text and film are explored, and I very much admire that you have also performed site visits. Thank you very much for the hard work that has gone into this venture. Keep up the excellent work. End quote. I'm very grateful for those remarks, David, and always amazed and grateful for this sense of community which makes episodes like the recent one on religion, etc. possible. At times, it is also all that has allowed this podcast to stay weekly, mainly down to John Ruth. David goes on to give a further link about the radio play written about the Angela Morley's writing of the score to Watership Down. I hope to hear this one day. This is, all this is in the thread welcoming him to the group, though the later comments can be difficult to see on some devices in true Facebook fashion. Welcome to the Owsler, David. So now, on with the film. A bit of a heavy one this week. Section 12. Captain Holly. This section covers from 36 minutes 20 to 38 minutes 40, and the equivalent chapters from the book are chapters 19, Fear in the Dark, 20, A Honeycomb and a Mouse, and 21, For Elohera to Cry. We find ourselves in the lane leading away from Nuthanger Farm, presumably later that morning, following Hazel and Pipkin's farm expedition earlier. The camera pans right to show the lone tree on Watership Down in the distance. Two birds noisily fly across the lane, and then the view pans left and zooms in on the ditch on the eastern side of the lane. This ditch is where the events of the next two sections of the film will take place. In the book, the equivalent ditch is the one at the foot of Warship Down itself that the rabbits use for shelter when going for Silfly after they first arrive at the down. The same ditch, of course, in which Hazel recovers later from his gunshot wound and in which he has one of my favourite conversations in the book, in chapter 28, at the foot of the hill. We cut to the interior of the ditch, obviously an active drainage ditch and dry during these summer months, as the rabbits run past, heading away from the farm towards the down. But then Bigwig, bringing up the rear, stops and turns back, listening. He has heard something coming up the line of the hedge. Hazel joins him as we too start here to hear an echoing cry of Zorn, the lapine word for destroyed or finished. The rest of the group are now with them. Bigwig moves towards the sound. Hazel asks if he can see what it is. Dandelion says he can hear it, 
Something big is approaching. Pipkin asks if it is a cat and cowers by Hazel, no doubt remembering their recent encounter at the farm. And then Bigwig is struck dumb with terror, as whatever it is calls his name. Twice. For the only time in the whole film, Bigwig retreats and hides behind other rabbits in his fear. Pipkin, who touchingly has a paw resting on Hazel, cries and starts to panic on seeing this, for if Bigwig is scared, then all hope is lost. Hazel shows his quality by telling him to keep quiet so he can hear what it is. The crying out of Bigwig's name becomes less echoing and more distinct as we see an eerie view along the dark void of the ditch. The terrified Bigwig says it is the black rabbit of Inlay. Hazel admonishes him as talk like that could make the others go tharn. In the book, only Bigwig, Dandelion and Speedwell are with Hazel at this point, having all come to the foot of the warship down to Sylphalay and Hazel stops Bigwig moving towards the terrible voice by leaving the ditch to discover its source. Bigwig later thanks him for doing so and says he will remember it. But here, in another moment of cinematic summary that diminishes Hazel's leadership a little, Bigwig advances alone past Hazel towards the sound along the ditch, now convinced it is the black rabbit calling him to the afterlife. As in the book, Bigwig has an unquestioning belief that when you are called by the black rabbit, you have to go. The more rational Hazel joins him after a moment's confusion at the sight of Bigwig willingly walking towards his death and tells him to stay where he is, then hesitantly asks who is there. Cut to a close-up of the edge of the ditch. Two grey paws appear as the voice, clearly not supernatural, cries, All dead! All zorn! A bedraggled and scratched grey rabbit appears and tumbles at the end of his strength into the ditch. The rabbits initially recoil in shock, but Bigwig instantly recognises Captain Holly of the Sandalford Alza, the warren the group left due to Fiverr's premonition of doom. In a moment of poor continuity, Hazel is suddenly by Holly, despite having been right next to Bigwig in the previous shot. Bigwig and the rest of the group join him, and Bigwig speaks to Holly, who looks up and opens his eyes, recognising his old fellow Owsler member and repeating, I've found you, in sheer relief. Unlike in the book, we do not learn why finding Bigwig specifically had become so important to him. Also here we are deprived of the company of the last surviving rabbit who travels with Holly, the Joker Bluebell. As far as we can tell, this is a Holly who has travelled on his own to Watership Down. Soon we will learn more about that impossible journey, but first Fiverr comments on a wound on his shoulder, though this looks like just one of many. Holly says he remembers Fiverr, how he was the one who saw it coming. In the book, this moment happens in calmer circumstances, halfway up the down after Holly has started to recover. But the calmer extended account of what happened to Sandalford will be dealt with in an altogether different way here. In the book, Holly gives his account of what he saw from outside the Warren, then Bluebell takes over with the visceral horror of what was going on underground and how he managed to escape. We hear Dandelion ask what happened, and, as the camera pans up, we are returned to the visionary style with which we saw Fiverr's terrible prediction of fields covered with blood. We see trees tumbling in a spiral as Holly says the warren was destroyed. There is a rumbling sound building. We ask here Hilt Silver ask how. In the background of the tumbling trees we can see a circle. That now becomes clearer. It is a view of the entrance of a burrow from underground. And then, as eerie music begins, we see earth falling into the burrow, covering the view. Holly's voice said men came and filled in the burrows. We see another hole being filled. And another. Holly says they couldn't get out. There was a strange sound, a hissing. We hear the sound and see a terrified rabbit, possibly intended to be Holly, trapped underground, first his mouth opening and closing in panic, then his face. In the dark of the filled-in warren, his fur is blue and his eyes are deep red. And then we enter the realm of the surreal, as the portrayal of events becomes more about conveying the emotional experience of dying in terror than about reality. Six disembodied rabbit heads, in the same blue with red eyes, move along converging burrow forms pursued along, along every path by a yellow gas. They converge and press together, pressing upwards as the paths behind them are closed. Holly says, the air turned bad. And now we see six terrified heads pressed together in another blocked run. Holly says, runs blocked with dead bodies. 
there is a building sound of voices echoing in despair. We see five heads desperately reaching upwards, the yellow gas all around them. The camera zooms in on one eye as it, as it closes in pain. Holly repeats, couldn't get out, in even more desperate tones. And now a more realistic shot of multiple whole rabbits crushed into a narrowing run, some with their eyes closed, some pathetically still trying to press forward. As Holly says, everything turned mad, we zoom in on a rabbit's eye, closing among a pressed together mass of five rabbits. The closing rabbit eye cross-fades and becomes a rift in turf that rips open, revealing red earth underneath. Holly says, Warren, earth, roots, grass, all pushed into the air. As he says this, we see pointed fence posts, two of them tipped with blood. They dip out of sight. Behind them we see the insanity of whole red trees and purple rabbit corpses flung into the air, with a fiery sky behind. Trees to a rabbit would be immovable objects. At last this motif from both Fiverr's vision and this memory of terror makes a kind of sense. The unnatural nature of what humans are capable of is symbolised by the impossible sight of whole trees ripped out of the ground. And now we see the green turf again. The black predator-like teeth of a human mechanical digger scrape into it, scoring a set of parallel red lines as it disappears into the background. The red lines move and swirl in a circle. Briefly, we see more tumbling tree branches join them as the camera pans down to rejoin the rabbits in the ditch. The music is suddenly calm. Dandelion says, Men have always hated us. Holly replies, No. They just destroyed the warren because we were in their way. Five in close up looks away and says, They'll never rest until they've spoiled the earth. In the book, this is part of a comment made by Holly before he even begins retelling what happened at Sandalford. At the time the film was made, and even more so when the book was written, the environmental movement had yet to begin really making any headway. As self-righteous as such a statement can sound to modern ears, at that time it was something that you could argue was not said nearly enough. Adams was a pioneer in including such a sentiment in his writing. And so ends a sequence in the film that left me at age 11 in shock when I first saw this film in 1978, to the extent that I barely even remember what came next. But we are far from finished with Holly's terrible account. Comparison with the book. In the book, the events we have just seen covered in two minutes and twenty seconds are covered over the course of three chapters. In chapter 19, Fear in the Dark, comes the terrifying discovery of Holly at the foot of the down during its early construction. Then in chapter 20, A Honeycomb and a Mouse, we learn of Holly's recovery from his journey, in amongst the other business of building the large barrow called the Honeycomb and Hazel having strange conversations with mice. Holly and Bluebell finally tell the full terrible story of what happened to Sandalford Warren in chapter 21, for El Achrera to cry. Holly beginning with what he saw from outside, Bluebell continuing with what he went through as he escaped from underground. We also hear about their difficult journey to the foot of Wardship Down, during which one rabbit, Toadflax, the Owlsler member who bullied Fiverr away from a cowslip in, in chapter 1, died from his injuries, and another, Pimpernel, was killed by the rabbits of the Warren of the Snares becoming the only rabbit to be directly killed by other rabbits in the whole book. All Holly can think of after that is finding Thlaley, or Bigwig, to tell him he was right. Holly's ear is ripped by the Warren of the Snares rabbits, and he arrives at the foot of Warship Down delirious, helped onward only by the good humour of Bluebell. The lone journey of the Holly of the 1978 film is very different, not to say somewhat mysterious. But we will deal with that as well as our first crime against the original book, as explained in episodes 14 and 54, next time. Let the jury be upstanding. Next time, we learn from Holly, far earlier than we might expect, of the Warren of Ephrafa, and place the 1978 film on trial for abuse of geography. Thank mm -hmm. you.